We are in our 7 o'clock a.m. hour. My guest has joined us, and she is Fadima Loren Mohammed, and she directs the EJUSA's New Trauma Advocacy Initiative, a program in which she runs a policing slash community project that brings hundreds of African-American leaders and police departments together to discuss issues of race, trauma, and violence. Fatima's work bridges criminal justice reform and public health practitioners in order to build a trauma-informed justice system using a public health lens. Equal Justice USA began this work after years of working with hundreds of crime survivors, largely families of murder victims, and finding that their needs from unaddressed trauma to financial challenges have gone unaddressed in the justice system, contributing to cycles of violence and incarceration. Using his expertise in coalition building, EJUSA is working to incorporate trauma intervention into the criminal justice reform agenda and make the link between trauma, victimization, race, and mass incarceration. She is a psychotherapist with a master's degree in counseling, psychology, and a specialization in trauma among adults, adolescents, and communities of color. She is a Fulbright Scholar finalist, recipient of the 2010 Social Transformation Award in Philadelphia, and Phi Beta Cap a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. All right, let us welcome to the Reading Circle microphones, Fatima Loren Mohammed. Ms. Mohammed, good morning. Good morning, Mark. How are you? I am well, thanks. And wow, you really are sounding good. I mean, sometimes the, the reception, depending on what phone folks are on, can get somewhat statically or you're very low, but yours is coming through loud and clear. So good morning to Great. you. Where are you calling out of? I'm in Jersey City. Ah, Jersey City. All right. So you're not too far from us. I'm, the campus is up here in Wayne, New Jersey, and I live and work in Patterson, New Jersey. So we're not too far off. All right. So, okay, let's let's talk a little bit about this whole thing of the Equal Justice USA. What is that? First off, what is that all about? Let's let folks know what EJUSA is all about, and then we can work our way into what you do with it. Sounds great. So EJUSA is a national criminal justice reform organization. We're really working to transform the justice system, as you said in the intro, from one that really harms people, right, through mass incarceration, through um, violence in prisons. Uh, to, you know, so it's incredibly harmful currently. We're here to reimagine the justice system to one that actually provides healing and support for people in the wake of harm. We want to break cycles of trauma. We want to break cycles of violence and uh, really redefine what it means to say we want justice. When we say we want justice, we're really saying true accountability. Um, and to us, that in includes healing communities. Um, so EJUSA has been around for over 25 years. Um, some of its primary work uh, to date has been uh, actually working to repeal the death penalty. Um, it repealed the death penalty in uh, New Jersey uh, about 10 years ago. And um, as, as um, you mentioned in the bio, we have uh, worked a lot with family members of murder victims who, if you imagine the kind of trauma of losing often a son, but, you know, many other um, family members to violence, to murder uh, that the people's trauma would be taken seriously by the government. And what we heard victims say over and over again, uh, survivors, uh, was not in my name will you kill another person. Not in my name will you spend all this money to, to harm more people. We want the justice system to invest in communities to make sure this never happens to another person. And there are approaches that actually can help stop harm before it starts. And the justice system should be invested in those things. So we really heard those stories and um, have been spending time thinking about a vision that allows us to, to actually launch campaigns and um, win legislation that can actually um, shift how we understand uh, what it means to address violence using very different approaches um, and getting really strong, powerful outcomes. That's what we're about. 
you know, I'm glad you went into the definition of justice, because as we were going along, that's one of the questions I was going to ask, because in many of our protests, you'll see folks with signs, we want justice or no justice, no peace or whatever. And the question kind of becomes, is, OK, what are you defining as justice or does mm-hmm. everyone have a lens of what justice means to him or her? Well, I think that any time you have the voice of people who have been impacted by no justice, people who have for generations been systematically harmed, um, in, and there are so many studies that point to this, stop and frisk policies, um, looking at the systematic way that people go into communities, um, that that level of um, uh, targeting will create a whole slew of frustrations and grievances that absolutely must be addressed. I think that that is the, the first step is to listen, listen to all the grievances, understand what people have gone through, not just in this, uh, not just nowadays, but systematically through history to really hear those stories. I think when people are protesting in the streets, they're like, understand and listen to our pain, recognize who we are, and that we're not, you know, if you heard this term gaslighting, have you heard of that term? I have. Uh, it's a it's a really powerful term, you know. Um, you know, gaslighting being, you know, it's from that uh, a play, right, from the '30s, where this husband would would like he turn down the, the the lights on the on the gaslight, right, and he'd do all these things to make his wife think she was going crazy, and right. when she would say, "Wait a minute, I'm I'm noticing this, I'm noticing that," he he'd say, "Well, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about." I think there are people in this country who have been calling for. Um, help and support and to notice the, the, the injustice for so many years. And people have been like, well, what are you talking about? Everything is just going just fine. That, that, that is what's producing people going in the streets. So the first step is to listen. At that point, when there's been an accountability, there's been a real understanding of the impact and People, this is a restorative justice process, right? Uh, you know, there's, you have to listen to people. You've got to say what the impacts have been. And then you have to hear what they're asking for. What are they asking for? What is it that they want? I think that when you actually sit down and hear what they want, they want to stop broken windows policies. They want to stop, stop and frisk. They want to, right? They want to really look at the system and say, what can we do to change it? So I think that what they're really saying is that we want something fair. We want something that is restorative as opposed to being harmful. Don't harm us. You know, um, I think that's really what the protests are about. And then, you know, I think that people's perceptions, because they get, you know, people see protests and they get concerned or worried. There's so much pent up frustration and anger. Yes, indeed. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's just, I, I can't underscore that this is, the, the anger of lifetimes. It's, it's not just, um, oh, this one thing happened, this one incident. This is accumulation. You're absolutely of, right. Yeah, of harm. Yeah, it is. So, and, and see, these guys, now, you and I could talk all day. And, I, and I'll tell you why, because I work in the schools, and the listening audience knows this. And interestingly enough, I guess education cuts across anybody I have on the show because I always can tie it in. But yeah. interestingly enough, where you're working at, I'm working to try to stem on the lower level. In other words, there's, yeah. I'm sure, just like you just asked me about gaslighting, you've heard the term uh, the prison pipeline from school yeah. to prison. And see, that's yeah. what I'm trying to stem at my level. My school is a okay. two to eight school, second grade to eighth grade. And I'm doing everything in my power to help our kids understand exactly what you were just talking about the and I, I kind of call it like the awakening. Like I need, I need you all to awaken to see what's going on, how the system works. It's a game. And like you, you're using the term systematic. It is truly systematic. And, and the sad part is, F- Fatima, is we've almost gone backwards with this current administration. Mm-hmm. Because a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, the president was out there in Long Island. And he was literally telling the police, don't be nice to him. 
you know, mm-hmm. when you put them in the car, you know, if they bump their head on the car going in, that's okay. Right. I mean, I mean, it was all right. kinds of nonsense that this man was right. speaking. And what has now done is now every police officer wasn't with that. I mean, some of the people that's you could right. see, you could see in the on the video, some of them their faces, and then there was a few that was loving it. And so when you start talking stop and frisk and all that kind of stuff, we are serving it. We we have an administration right now that wants to bring that back. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you something. I, I'm i really concerned about the rhetoric of this president, and I, and particularly because there, I'll, I'll be really honest with you, I don't think any police department in this country wants a Freddie Gray on their hands. Correct. Right? Wants a Mike Brown on their hands. I don't think any department is interesting interested in further increasing us versus them, um, furthering tensions, like it's, it's when the consequences are too great. Um, I don't think any community wants that. So I see that there's just, they're just out of touch with actually the, the lion's share of departments on the ground are asking communities, what can we do? Or at the very least, communities are demanding that you pay attention and, and that departments are responding. So I think at a local level, there's, there's a very different dynamic going on, and I'm not saying it's all thick. Right. What I am saying is the fact that before, you know, if you look a couple years ago, um, which is, which is kind of crazy, I, I remember... 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people talking about police brutality. Right. And th- those would remain local issues. Um, you know, I lived in Philadelphia. They, they would remain local issues. They remain something that people didn't necessarily take. I remember when Angela Davis used to come and speak and talk about mass incarceration. And, you know, her, I mean, she, she always brings a crowd, but it was not at the level it is now. Something has shifted in the national dialogue around these issues. So now these local incidents that are so painful and have been painful for decades, this is not the first time, have become national news. And as a result, it puts into sharper focus the concerns, the grievances. It, 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 it fosters more conversation. People are looking into the history. You know, you have these reports. And during the Obama years, the Department of Justice uh, did a lot to uh, fund looking at these issues, um, reports that, you know, actually looked at, and and litigation, really looking at, um, uh, you know, consent decrees that would actually uh, push departments to create totally new plans and strategies for, towards community policing. Um, so, you know, that's the case in Newark, New Jersey, actually, right now, but there are a number of departments across the country. And so the tide is shifting, and I, I want to believe um, that the way history is, um, that it's cyclical, and that where we are right now is a reaction to, it's a strong reaction from this current administration of a lot of progress, actually, a lot of good dialogue on the ground, but that that good dialogue must continue because every day the department is accountable to the mayor, the department is accountable to the community, and I see locally far more conversation that the president can't stop. I, I see it and... Um, I'm, again, I, I'm not saying it's fixed or it's done right. or anything like that, but it, but at least no one wants to, to, to be another Ferguson. They just don't. And they're doing what they have to to start. And starting takes a lot, and it takes sustaining that contact. And that's why we need a movement. Movements uh, push, and they ensure that in different areas there is uh, – there is progress, and that's what we're experiencing in this country, this movement towards change. And as that movement gets more refined 
and more coordinated in terms of what it's asking for and get some wins, which has been happening, um, and that we talk about those wins, I think people start to see a counter narrative to, you know, what this president's been saying. You start to see locally and actually bar- bipartisan support for change. And that's, I think, very powerful. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate because, as I said, on, on my end, I'm trying to get children to understand how not to wind up being involved with police other than a positive experience to begin with. In all these situations that we that we bring up, or let me ask the question another way. Have there been cases where there has been an upstanding African-American child or male or what have you that had absolutely no record. The only thing they were doing was walking home and they were brutalized by the police because there are some other. And and believe me, I'm asking this from a hypothetical standpoint because I know exactly what goes on, but I, I still need to throw it out there for the listening audience. There are those that will say the folks that were involved in all these vast brutalities had already broken the law to begin with, quote unquote. How do we now keep folks from doing anything that would attract attention from the police to begin with, because the argument would be those who don't break the law don't have those encounters with the police. We don't have to fight for justice for somebody who's abiding by the law. Now, you and I know, but I'm asking it anyway, as this is a show that we debate. Talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, there are numbers that support this, right? Like the, the, the reality is that, the fact that you're even asking that question to me communicates the problem. No one deserves to die. No one deserves to die. There are people who are mass murderers. Okay. Who are when Dylan Roof killed. Okay. People who were at church. Okay. Right. He was peaceably taken from the location and put in jail. Absolutely. Okay. And, right, armed and dangerous, peaceably taken to prison. You know, the Arizona shooter, the same thing, okay, who shot a movie theater. We are not talking about people who, um, there's a real question, right, of, of whether they are armed and dangerous and they are peaceably taken down. The reality is that people have a hard time understanding what the numbers are showing, which is that there is a systemic issue with law enforcement targeting people of color, particularly young men of color, on a whole range of things. Correct. And I'm African American. Um, I I have a brother, I have cousins who share with me, and my brother's in law enforcement, but who share with me incidents in which they are walking down the street uh, and they've experienced this targeting. It is such a a, a deeply felt story, I think, for those who experience it. And for those who don't, it's it's unfathomable. It's like, I can't even imagine that. and, and that's really the problem. And I think, uh, you know, if I can be frank with you. No, I need you the, to be. That's, yeah. uh, I need you to be. I mean, with the exception of, you know, we can't get profane. But other than that, be as frank as you want to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I really think that this issue around police and communities of color dates back so far. It goes back to the history of policing in this country. And there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of trauma on both sides. And that's what's producing, I think, this lack of conversation. Most people, if it's something rational, you present an argument, you show them a report, you know, this how science works. Here's, here's a report. Here are the numbers. You can look at the numbers and go, okay, yeah, um, th- that I can see that. I can see that, you know, so Tamir Rice, is a young man. He's 12 years old. He's playing in a park. Correct. Okay? He gets shot down. Okay? And obviously, an innocent, beautiful 12-year-old boy. I saw this picture of him, and I, I, I got so emotional because 
even in the face of those examples, and there are numerous ones, but even in the face of those examples, people still have something to say. Correct. And that's that, and that's exactly why that, I threw that because that's yeah. that's the that's the talk, that's the rhetoric. Well, had they not done anything to begin with, right. the police wouldn't have been. That's not necessarily true, and this is where the issue comes in, and why we have groups such as EJ USA or Equal Justice USA, because we're not being heard. And the truth of the matter, and you're a psychotherapist, so that means you, your degree is in psychology. There's some psychology that goes on that people really overlook and don't think about. And this is my opinion. So I, I'll go back to the disclaimer. The views and opinions heard here are solely those of the host and guests and not necessarily supported by. I get, Probably my opinion is that you have some subconscious things going on. You have some subliminal and subconscious things going on that when that call comes through and it's in an African-American community or the person thinks or the police officer thinks it's an African-American, there's some subconscious things going on. There's some fear going on. They're already amped up higher than they would be if they were dealing with a Caucasian perp. That's why you're getting what you're getting in terms of the young man in South Carolina being walked out peacefully versus had he been African American, he probably would have been killed on the scene or at least roughed up. So there's there's there already there's this fear. If I'm if I'm if I'm a police officer that if I'm going to be dealing with a person of color, I already have heightened to another level. And now if there's a chase or anything that ensues, I get ramped up even more. And now once I catch that person, I'm to the, I'm in a state where I don't even realize just how much damage I'm doing. And see, that's what I, now if you were to question somebody and then question them, they would deny that up the hill. Oh, no, that's not a we regardless of who it is. We come at them the same way. Not true. Yeah. And I think. What's so powerful about the research on implicit bias, and this is why people use that term, implicit, the tests for implicit bias are the, the millisecond reactions we have right. to stimuli, right. which are before your conscious mind is operating, right? Absolutely. Are, are the, when you are in that the thinking part of your brain, the decision making, it takes a long time to get there. We have a region of our brain that developed much earlier on um, and is reactive, right? So when you trip, you don't have to think, oh, my goodness, I'm falling. You know, I should do something about it. It, 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 it would take too long. You'd be, you know, on the floor already. So your, your body reacts, and there are these, these trigger hair responses. So you're absolutely right. Implicit bias, uh, it, it, just a field of understanding um, race, racism, from the standpoint of those split-second decisions uh, that happen, split-second reactions that happen, um, and, and you know, in a controlled space, but also out in the field. Um, now, listen, I am not a, in law enforcement. I do not know what it's like to go towards bullets, to be to get a call, and and say they're armed and dangerous, go, right? Um, I don't know what that's like. And I want to say that there are people who put their lives on the line every single day, and that, that uh, is, is worth acknowledging and being grateful for. Absolutely. Because I don't have to do it. Someone else is doing it. And I'm very grateful um, that there are people who are trained to do that. That being said, the, the, the implicit bias, once you acknowledge it, right, acknowledging it allows us to do something about it, Correct. to actually shift it, to actually being aware of it. You know, bias is bias, and I believe that bias is universal, that we're biased towards lots of different things. And, but the systemic bias that isn't acknowledged, right, is what is harmful. When, when you have information and you're not using it to make a, a, a department better, to actually ensure that you're not harming the communities you've been sworn to serve and protect, now we have an issue. Correct. And, and I think that th- there's, there's not been a seriousness. I, like I, I believe that there should be a seriousness. You know, when, when we say officer... We should think highly trained. You know, I think about like ninjas, right? Who are just right. so precise, who are so you know um, uh, aware, who who know how to do de-escalation in a way that 
is above and beyond, like the, that level of training and skill. And we're not there yet. The, the training for law enforcement is just a couple months. Right. And, it's, it, and you're given a gun and you're endowed with the authority to, to um, shoot and kill someone. That's serious. And we, so we really need to look at training of law enforcement in a completely new way. And you're right, in terms of like you were right? just saying about the whole de-escalation. And that de-escalation ought to apply regardless of who it is. Regardless Absolutely. if it's male, female, gay, straight, Absolutely. black, white. That de-escalation methodology ought to apply regardless of who. It shouldn't be, I'm going to get especially hyped up if it's this group and less hyped up if it's that group. I'm going to be more fearful if it's this group and less fearful if it's this group. The procedure is the procedure is the procedure and should right. be applied to all. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and, and, when, and, and not only that, accountability means that we're tracking this. We're paying attention to how uh, engagements happen and, and departments should be constantly asking the question, right. could we have done this differently? And what do we do to make sure that in the future it's done differently and that community members and those who are impacted are at the table being, being briefed and, and understanding what's going on? Because I think there's a, there's a lack of information and what it, it, it spurs further tension because you know, people will see something unfold, and, and we see this in our trainings, and I'd love to talk about them here. You know, we, are, we have these trauma trainings where we have police and community sit in a room together, and these are, these are community members who are like, listen, I saw on the corner of Ba and Ba, this happened. What went on? Why was there no recourse? Ba, 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 ba. And it's like people are just left with, all these questions and frustrations and anger, and there's no, sp- where are the spaces to actually air out grievances? And, and, and it's one thing to say, okay, we'll, you, you know, submit a complaint and we'll investigate and we'll get back to you. That's not enough for community members. They want to know that you take it seriously, that, that you, you know, the concern itself should foster bigger questions around police culture, police policy, police training, that, that now you're really honoring the, the, the spirit of the concern. We, we, we want a, a, a force that takes seriously structural racism, takes seriously issues of implicit bias, ensures that... Uh, De-escalation is used above all else, period. Has a plan for community outreach, has a plan for engaging, understands trauma and its forms, and, and understands what they can do so that they are not re-traumatizing people, that they're actually supporting the healing and support of people in communities, that, that if we had... Uh, if we had a force that was capable of doing that, we would, I think we'd begin the healing process. There's, we still have to account for the past, right? Um, but, but we could at least stop the bleeding. And right now it's bleeding. There's a lot of, there's just a Absolutely. Lot. A matter of fact, it seemed like the cut may have been widened. Like I said, I, 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 this That's new right. administration, I mean, it was always bad. But I think with this administration, people are emboldened. Or they've be, they've come. I think what happens with this administration and the reason that he is as popular as he is, whatever his group is, is they feel he's saying what we want to say, but we can't. He's you know this president is doing and saying things that we've always wanted to do, but we can't do. But through him, he's doing it. So therefore, since he's doing it, we can do it too. And that's so making things worse than what it already was now interestingly enough i heard you saying something about the numbers but the game that's being played is folks try to tell us 
we don't see what we see. They try to tell us those numbers don't exist. That's they right. try to tell us those numbers don't mean anything. They try to tell us what we saw on that video did not occur. I mean, this is just going back to the Rodney King days, but it was happening yeah. prior to that. But Rodney King kind of put it on the map of video and folks still saying, no, that's not what you saw. <laughs> yeah. He just got right. the life beat out of him, but you didn't see that. We had a right. situation where the, the, the gentleman was let off a couple of weeks ago that you clearly could hear him saying what he intended to do and got out the car and did it. And they, they again, you didn't hear that. You didn't see that. It didn't occur. Mm. But that's that's where the problem is. Like you said, until until we get serious about, look, this is the situation. This is the reality of it. What are we really seriously going to do that's to right. change that? It, it's right. it's it's going to be it's a tough road, and and when you have somebody that's perpetuating, I mean, when you get the president of the United States stand up and yeah. say, "Don't be too nice to him," if you yeah. need to bump their head in the car as they get in, then so be it. I mean, that's 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 uh, that's serious yeah. there, because that, it is, it really is, and and then you and I'm going back to my first question, and because I, I tell my kids all the time, I said, "Let me help you all understand something." I said, during the school day, you see me dressed up in suit and tie as your principal. I said, but when I go home, I put on a hoodie and jeans just like you do. And if I'm walking the street and something's going down, I stand just as much chance of being brutalized or shot or killed or arrested, particularly if it's a mistaken identity, as you do. Mm. For the very fact that I'm an African-American male. And if that's one of the groups that's talking, because back to stop and frisk, when Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York, and, and I get his whole quality of life initiative i understand it but at the same time if you're going to use that as a guise to target people of color or various groups then you kind of okay is this really about quality of life or is this really about you know what i think they're the ones that's causing quality of life to be bad for everyone else because even <laughs> and that's what i mean you could talk all day even whenever the president got in let's make america great again what are, what are we really talking about here when was america yeah. not great what are we what are, so when you start saying quality of life and you start targeting certain groups really are what you're saying is well if these groups didn't exist our quality of life would be a heck of a lot better mm, right right it's incredible it's painful it's it's really painful um, to, as you said, the, the, you, despite the research, despite the numbers, you know, it's like before there was proof, there were stories. People right. didn't listen to the stories. And then there were the numbers. People didn't listen to the numbers. Um, and then there were protests, right? People got to the streets and people still are uh, frustrated. Right. Uh, because they don't feel the stories are being honored and honored is different than what fact checking honored is i hear the grievance i hear the structural analysis right so it's not always about okay this i'm not saying this isn't important but what i'm saying is if you see a video and it's like this this well you know, if you saw it from a different angle and you get hyper-focused on this incident, but we're not honoring the situation, right. honoring the right. pain of those families and communities who are saying, you know what, this has happened to us times a million, right. okay? This has happened to us and we didn't, we, we're angry because of the cumulative pain and you have to acknowledge that. Right. Not just, oh, this camera angle shifting to here, you would have seen something different. No. The, the, but the incident is obvious, it's incredibly important. So let me, not, I don't want to make it sound like that's not, but all the incidents before that were not publicized, where, where no one knows the names of people. Right. Those are also important. And when people are aggrieved, they're talking about the whole thing. And in our training, we actually talk about that. So, we, we, you know, we have this trauma training where we talk about the trauma on both sides and we talk about the cumulative grievances and the historical trauma of policing in this country, that it's traumatized people and that there is a need for departments to address the historical trauma. Correct. Right? That, that you can't escape. You, even if you did everything right today, okay, everything right, it still doesn't stop the, 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 the systematic 
anger and grievance that has not been addressed. Correct. And and that we have to weave that analysis in. Um, and I think when officers understand that their badge, just the badge itself, is traumatizing, it's very powerful. It's very powerful, though, because to them, you know, for the individual who puts on the badge, and, and it has a real intention of doing the right thing, they can get bi- bitter over time because it's just like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not out here, you know, shooting up black right. men. I'm doing the right thing. Uh there may be some bad apples out there, but then the whole department suffers. Correct. When you say, well, but your badge itself is traumatizing, and the department has to understand the historic grievances. And I, I don't want to make history, history sound like it was a long time ago. It's just coming from a long time ago to the present. No, it's no, present. no. The, no you're, you're absolutely right in terms of your, your thought process in terms of because it's always been there. And it seems to go, it, it goes in kind of like cycles. It'll be more prevalent in one minute and then less less out there, for lack of a better way of putting it. But that still doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's still there. It's just that you hear about it at more times than others. And that's, that's why right. the trauma that right. you're talking about exists, because people have had some very bad experience. Now, me personally, I can honestly say I've never had a bad experience per se with a police mm-hmm. officer. But that's been my experience. That's not everyone's experiences. And I can't imagine when you're talking trauma, when you talk about the trauma, I don't care how disrespectful or how I'm trying to think of the word because I don't want to call a kid bad. But I mean, for lack of a better term, I don't care how bad your child may be. There is no parent that wants to get that call that their child is dead. Oh my God! There is that. No. So I can't uh, in my I can't fathom that call. No. Innocent or guilty, did it or didn't do it. Whatever they were doing, as you said earlier, nobody deserves to die for it. And so I can't fathom getting that kind of call, saying that your child is now did somebody like the Trayvon Martin case or somebody like one of these other cases where those parents had to get that call that your yeah. child is down in the morgue. Because of the bullet of some type of, of, of behavior, whether it was police or whatever. I, I just can't. Yeah. I really can't. So when you start talking trauma, I don't even know if the word trauma even justifies what those people must be feeling for the rest of their days. Because that mm-hmm. one decision of that police officer, or for that matter, another perp in the street, there, that one decision changed those lives forever. That's right. Yeah. That kid in South Carolina, or, or for that matter, we can go, I mean, the guy over a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas, Las changed Vegas. folks' lives forever. Yeah. Folks will never be the same again. Now, they'll they'll live, they'll get through it, but they will never, ever be the, I mean, because truth be told, when any of us lose a family member, even naturally, it's difficult. And we all know that one day we got to go. Well, we all know one day we're going to pass away. With it. But even when it, ha- you know that, and even when it happens, it's still difficult. So I can't imagine when someone has to go out in a violent way. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, and police, and see, the other, the, the flip side of it, and that's what I was saying, when you have so many variables working at the same time, because once adrenaline gets to going, once yeah. anger kicks in, once I've now had to, ch- I've asked this person to stop and they ran. Now I'm getting even more heightened. And then, as I said earlier, when you couple that with a preconceived ideal to begin with, that okay, this particular perp is a person of color, so they're more likely to have a weapon, or I'm more likely to lose my life because I'm dealing with a person of color. See, that's very deceptive, because that's where our Caucasian brothers and sisters, if they really kind of flipped it, could be knocking police officers over left and right. Because, I don't know, have you ever looked at the news, and when something goes down in the suburb, the person being interviewed always says, we didn't think that could happen here? Yeah. Well, the police yeah. could get very, they, could, they need to really be careful of that, of who they have a preconception of who will and who won't. Because if yeah. someone were to figure that pattern out, they say, well, you know what? They don't think I'm going to do this because I'm Caucasian. So yeah. guess what? I got something waiting for them. Versus they automatically assume that a person of color is going to be loaded with a weapon or whatever. And they're not. Because that's what we're getting. They're, they're making the assumption that the person of color is going to be more violent than the Caucasian person. And statistics do not bear that out. 
And that's what we were saying a couple of minutes ago. You're going to tell us numbers that we see. You're going to tell us those numbers don't exist or don't mean anything. You're going to tell us that videos we watched, that that didn't occur. And I've said this on the air publicly, so I'll say it again. And I know it's kind of sort of recent since he was just released on October 1st. Personally, I believe O.J. OJ Simpson killed them people. I really do. Nobody's going to tell me any different. I believe O.J. Simpson killed that girl, and I believe O.J. Simpson killed the guy. Because I know how angry you can get in such a rage that you don't even realize what you've done. That, that's how enraged one can be. And what people don't understand is the reason folks celebrated so much when O.J. was found not guilty was because that's what had been happened to African Americans and people of color historically for the ages. We had been getting killed and lynched, and the jury knew. And matter of fact, the, the, the person that was charged of it would sit there on the witness stand and laugh, along with the judge, along with the jury, and they would walk. And in the meantime, you have an African American, such as Emmett Till, or somebody dead. So when the whole O.J. Simpson case came out, the f- script was flipped. And they didn't like that feeling. But that's the feeling historically we felt forever. And that's where all this pent up frustration is coming from that you're describing. Mm. That this has been us forever. And like you said, when folks are not being heard, they start venting their frustration in other ways. That's right. Not only heard and honored. Correct. Heard and honored. You know, the amount of pain and anger people are carrying um and they still live i mean they still right like most people um are living their lives right right um we don't spend our days in perpetual rage and protest we are mostly living our lives living law-abiding lives and but we're still carrying that anger and rage and it's not going anywhere it's not being heard or honored and it's I think it, it, it increases that cycle of, of uh, this us versus them mentality um, because of that. And if we could uh, understand that that's what's going on, you're not listening and you're not honoring. We're, that's, what rest- that's a framework of restorative justice. Correct. And why we believe in it so deeply, why we talk about South Africa and the kinds of things. People need to be heard. Everyone need- deserves to be heard Correct. at the very least. And it will do, I think, wonders in terms of breaking cycles of trauma. I want to talk about something else that you said, which was earlier on in, in, uh, about education, um, when you said you're further upstream working on um, you know, the lives of young people. Right. I want to go back to that point because before we get a young person who may have had one behavior or another uh, where there's even... Uh, a pursuit or, or, you know, a a need to apprehend this person. Before we even get there, there are so many interventions using a public health lens that can actually stop behavior um, before it starts. So the, 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 the science behind violence is such that you can, it, it, that there, it's in networks. What I mean by that is the the predictor of future violence is exposure to trauma, right? So if you're exposed to Correct. trauma, you are more likely. And not and and the, here's the thing: knowing that does not mean well. Then we we lock them up or we throw them. No, that arms us with power to then say, well, look, we, if we know there's been exposure to uh, violent trauma, we can actually do something. We can intervene at when people are victims of harm to put them on paths towards healing where they're less likely to retaliate or to take up arms themselves. Correct. And so there have been programs across the country that have been doing this, and they see 70% reductions in violence in neighborhoods um, and violent shootings. They're seeing, I mean, incredible numbers of reductions. Well, violence isn't even happening. Right. No one is picking even, even picking up a weapon. Um, there are uh, hospitals uh, where uh, violent uh, victims, people who are receiving gun stabbings and gunshot wounds, 
when they're in the hospital, they are providing interventions uh, for that person, asking for what help and healing they need in their lives. And people are four times less likely to, to then go out and do anything violent in the wake of their own harm because people ask them what they needed, which is incredibly powerful. Um, so there's a way of going further upstream where you're using health as a framework where you're understanding we want to provide health and support and healing for people, people who um, have resources, who are getting educated, who, who have robust um, opportunity in their lives are far less likely to engage in, in behavior. And we can, and, and that's something that then stays um, located in community supports. It means investment in communities. Now means we are hiring people uh, in communities to be mentors. We're hiring people to be interventionists or healthcare workers who are doing this community outreach. So it's an economic investment as well. So it locates the job of um, violence prevention in communities managed by people who are looking at the health and healing of people so that the need for uh, downstream approaches, right, uh, just becomes less and less. We don't, we don't need, uh, because when police, when you get to the point where it's a police officer intervening, again, who have the authority with a gun, that, that intervention, first of all, should still be using de-escalation tactics, right? Even when an officer is involved, there should, there should, the, the use of a gun should, should be only in extreme cases, right? Correct. So we want to, we want to think, rethink policing Correct. and how it's deployed. Um, but we, we want to start upstream as well and make sure that people aren't even interacting because th- it's being handled. It's being Correct. handled and it's located. And there, there are investments that can be made in, in institutions um, getting those resources to do that kind of support. And it's very targeted. So um, I, 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 there are lots of programs that actually... We're stu- there are actually research on the books that demonstrate their ability to reduce um, violence. No, you're absolutely and we want to be right. Invest- right. We want to be investing in those. Some of them are school-based, right? Looking at disciplinary policy, right. so you're breaking the school-to-prison pipeline. Correct. Some of it's located in the community. Uh, I told you about the hospitals, um, but there, there, there are many, and the the framework of these programs are how do we support and heal and provide resources for for people. Um, so we, we care about that. We want to make sure that, especially victims of violence, that they're getting the need, their needs taken care of. And for too many young men of color, they're not seen uh, for when they're, when they're victimized. They're not seen for surviving violence themselves or experiencing trauma. Sometimes that trauma goes back to when they were babies, when they were children. No, you're absolutely right, because at, in the building that I serve, it's in an urban area, and a good number, and I was having this discussion with someone not long ago, where a good number of our children are actually suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome. Literally, just what you were saying, our kids have been traumatized in their various family lives or in their communities or their neighborhoods. I can't tell you, if you were to come to my school and ask the children, if I got all of them in the auditorium and said, if anyone in here has lost a family member to violence, stand. Oh, you would be amazed how oh. many of the kids stand. Whether it be a father, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a mother, or somebody. Yeah. You would be amazed how many of the kids stand whenever you ask that question. Hmm. And it is trauma. And that's what they're dealing with. And that's like I have to that's work right. with my team, with my teaching team to help them understand. I'm not saying you have to excuse the behavior, but you got to at least understand what might be driving it. Understand. You got to at That's least right. understand that you have a traumatized child here in front of you that right. may not be concentrating on two plus two equal four. Well, here's the thing, Mark. The, again, the, the the brain science. If you look at the adolescent brain, and you understand 
ACEs, right, adverse childhood experiences, has real significant um, impact on brain development. Um, when you've been traumatized and you have some of those uh, trauma um, hormones like adrenaline, cortisol, pump, just pumping through your system, it's the equivalent of not getting night's sleep. It's the equivalent of, of actually being high, like on marijuana, right? It's like, it's like the, the level of stress, what stress does to the body is... Is, is really harmful over time when you're bathing in it all the time, meaning your body wow. constantly has those toxins. It changes. You can look at an adolescent brain that experiences trauma and normal adolescent brain development, and you see differences. You see um, areas like uh, the amygdala, which is responsible for uh, a whole host of things, uh, slightly smaller Okay, and uh, hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, so even memory retention can be affected by trauma. So it's not just putting lip, it's not just lip service to this. This is real. Now, again, that does not mean that. So first of all, anytime we talk about trauma, you have to talk about resilience. Right. Because for kids to come to school, for families, right. well, the kind of resilience people in the face of trauma is remarkable. So you have to, it's a strength space framework, but you have to acknowledge it. Okay. Right. Um, you have to know that young people are capable, but then you got to give them the tools and you have to understand what the harm has actually done to affect them. So there's science behind this. Uh, there's, there's real impacts uh, on memory. There are real impacts um, on, on brain development. And if you're aware of that, you can actually do something about it. There are interventions that actually support young people, um, often with emotional regulation, affect reg regulation. Um, so what that means is um, giving young people trauma-informed strategies, tools that allows them to notice when when um, the the parts of their person. Uh, it's hard to explain this, but. No, I'm following you. you know, fine. I hope get, that I, I mean, yeah. maybe because I'm in education or because I work with the kids, I know exactly what you're talking about. As yeah. a matter of fact, you're, you're 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 giving me some ideas because one of the challenges that I have is you we, we have folks who truly do not get it, and they honestly think they're 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 working out of a lens based on their filters and their experiences and where they live and their children and so forth and so on. So they totally do not relate to such a a description like we're talking about a kid that's been traumatized and what happens is the child now comes to school sitting in class and all they hear is the teacher fussing at them you can't do this you can't do that oh you wouldn't believe what he couldn't do oh you wouldn't believe what she did today i mean they're getting that kind of sarcasm and read between the lines type of and and fussing 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 and then you wonder why the kid doesn't produce because you now have put that on top of the trauma and they're sinking deeper and deeper into not producing and yet when somebody comes along and is giving them encouragement, you get a totally different child. Whenever yes. someone is coming on and they're encouraging and saying, you know what, I know it's tough for you right now, but I guess what, you can get it. Let's try it. Let's do this. No, don't worry about it if you don't get it right the first time. Let's keep working. When somebody works with them like that, you see them begin to bloom. But when you see a teacher that is just constantly berating them and talking about what they can't do. I walked into a class the other day and I walked out and said, that class was a bastion of negativity. Mm. That was, uh, that's a quote that's what I, t I told my colleague I told one of the vice principals I said I, I walked in that class and walked. that was a bastion of negativity I don't know who my I goodness. felt more sorry for the teacher or the children and, and to be quite honest with you I, the children because I said they got to listen to that for 40 to 90 minutes a day so I have some work to do in terms of, and some of the things that you've just been talking about is going to be some of my launching points. As a matter of fact, you and I are going to have to talk offline because there's some things I need to kind of like, in terms of trying to help staff understand trauma that kids may be going through and why what we're doing is making it even worse because they're traumatized at home, traumatized in the street, and then get traumatized at school. That's right. So, Mark, we have a trauma training uh, in uh, the city of Newark. Um, and they're going on right now where we, and we bring police and communities together. And when I say community, it's, it's community residents, um, but it's also, and young people, uh, but it's also, uh, 
school administrators will come. We have nurses come. We have people who um, are in social services that will come. Um, youth serving organizations like mentoring programs, they will come. And we talk, we'll, we break this down. We talk about trauma. Um, you know, so it's three sessions. Um, the, the, the ones that are upcoming, so you can go to our website, ejusa.org. Okay, again, EJUSA.org, and you can click on, um, uh, there's a, a flyer that says violence. You can right. click on it, and it will um, talk about the fall trauma trainings, and you can see the dates. Um, it's three sessions. Uh, they're a week apart, um, and they're five hours each. And you say five hours, that's, you know, it's a totally 15, total of 15 hours. Right. Uh, but it is, it is, it's so deep because... We're not only talking about, you know, in the first session you talk about the different types of trauma that we described, the individual, the complex or chronic trauma that's happening all the time, and then the historical trauma. We're going to talk about trauma. The second session, we say, okay, well, now we understand trauma. What are we going to do about it, right? What, are, what can you take away with you that you can in, in a deploy right now to actually, um, how do you actually interact with a trauma survivor, um, and, and put them on paths towards healing. Right. So we work on that. And then the third session, we actually do application. So what does that actually mean? And then during application, we've had um, assistant principals there who said, oh, my goodness, this is giving me ideas. And they'll develop, they'll start thinking about uh, policies or new things that they can do within schools. Absolutely. We also are doing, doing we, so we, but we're really looking at from soup to nuts and ensuring that officers are involved because we want officers to know that there are community driven solutions um, and that it's not always on law enforcement, that there are partnerships That's right. um, that can be deployed and that office. So this is deeper than coffee with a cop, right? It's, it's, we want to see officers understand deeply what cycles of trauma look like right. and, and that there are partnerships with other entities that can actually address those things. But that when officer, they'll think twice as they're interacting with young, with people in the streets saying, wait a minute, I've seen this young man before and his mother actually, you know, was, 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 um, you know, shot or brother was killed right. or, you know, like all of those things that they'll have that analysis. Right. Um, just like you're describing with teachers to see and then to say, wow, this, like, what encouragement can I give this young person? Right. Because that encouragement goes a long way for survivors of harm. Correct. Knowing, pe- holding people up to their strengths, their resilience, in the wake of their trauma means a lot. Feeling for people to, trauma survivors to be respected for the work they're doing. Now, it doesn't excuse behavior, but it helps you understand it. And then you know what to do to support them, not do those sorts of behaviors in the future. When I tell you, but the, here's the thing, this is not just, this is, this is not, we're not just saying, oh, by doing this, we, there, it, there's real evidence to support that things shift. Now, we've, we're, we've been piling this program uh, with the Newark Police Department. Um, this is our second year. We've trained hundreds of people. We're finding, we have an evaluator, a programmed evaluator, who has um, been working with us. We have found some pretty astounding things in terms of uh, what's, what's happened in the wake of, of this training. Um, so 12 out of 15 participants have, have actually started to provide trauma support, right? Um, so they're actually using these tactics out in the, the field when they are interacting with trauma survivors, right? They're, they're understanding each side. They're, there's like mutual understanding that's built between police and community members. So listeners can actually come and, and get this experience and just like you, Mark, have this aha moment where it's like, wait a minute, I can see the application of this in, in my own uh, uh, professional lives personally, right, um, but can also support others. Uh, let's say you're, you're a resident. Having your ideas 
um, uh, heard by those who are in the department um, because the next phase is to take these trainings and actually start implementing um, on a policy level, um, get investment from the state uh, to for these sorts of programs. We, we're not just talking about trauma. We actually want to to shift the way we handle trauma in New Jersey. Absolutely. Shift the way that it happens. And that's in Patterson, right? Places like Camden. We want to make sure uh, we want to, we want to see this in New, in New Jersey. We want to see it in the country. Right. Um, wh- when you have this analysis and, and it's not just a trauma in the community, it's trauma for the officers too, because trauma in the officers impacts use of force. Correct. Issues. Because it's a very high. Suicide yeah, exactly. There's, so there's there, there's a real opportunity we see with this framework, seeing the other side, but also doing something about it. Now, I need to take a hard stop and do the weather and all that stuff because we're in the 8 o'clock hour. But if you've just joined us, I hope you've been with me since 6. But certainly, if you wasn't with me from 6, certainly I hope you've been with me since 7. As my guest is Fatima Loren Muhammad. And we're talking about a plethora of issues. And it's issues that are extremely important to talk about way of life i mean if you want to talk about way of life the things that we're talking about this morning will improve it for everybody but we as she just said we have to move beyond the talk into implementation and i'll say this before i go to the break a very good friend of mine is a police officer and she's very community oriented here in patterson and and she always says she said mark you know what my issue is the whole thing with the police brutality thing is that the kids that you're working with and we're working with they won't want to become police officers that we like, going up the line. We won't have any children who are interested in becoming police officers, particularly people of color, children, African-American children, Hispanic children, because they will constantly. And if that happens, now you continue to perpetuate the cycle of people who don't look like us in our communities. And the cycle continues. I'll talk a little bit about that when we come back. But we are in the 8 o'clock hour. I'm going to go ahead and let you know what's going on with the weather and everything else that I need to do also. And then when we come back, we'll continue our discussion. WPSC, Wayne, New Jersey. On the radio, 88.7 FM. Online, gobrave.org. A tune-in radio station. Part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. WPSC. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only... Brave New Radio. Here's your North Jersey weather report. All right, we're working our way up to a high today of 75 a.m. clouds. However, it'll be sunny this afternoon. I'm glad of that since I'm going to be working on this playground at the school. 62 as a high. Then on tomorrow, 77 as a high, low of 50. And on Monday, 59 as a high, 38 as a low, mostly sunny. Tuesday, 61 as a high, 45 as a low, sunny, and Wednesday, sunny as well, 70 as a high, 46 as a low. Yes, indeed. You are listening to Brave New Radio, and we are having are talking about a brave topic this morning, and that is trauma. And there's trauma on both sides. As we were talking right before I shared that information with you, there's trauma on both sides. There's trauma on the side of the police. Because for many, Fatima, police officers, if they've had to kill somebody or they have killed somebody in the line of duty, they suffer from trauma themselves. And so now you have trauma on trauma, which is not going to be a good equation. And right before I I went into the 8 o'clock hour thing, I shared with you a very good friend of mine, Sergeant Eason, Sharon Eason. She's been on the show as a matter of Sharon has been a guest on the show, and we've talked kind of sort of similar from the police officer side. And one of the things she shares with me is, she said, my fear is we will have children coming through school who will not want to be in law enforcement or who will not want to be police officers because of the bad reputation and the rap that we always get. Uh, and, and that's a valid concern because at, we do need officers well-trained who are diverse 
Yes. We need a force that's diverse. We need a diverse force who understands it and gets it. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Like I said a couple of minutes ago, in some situations you get trauma on trauma, and that's not a good equation. No, and, you know, it's a a two-pronged thing. Um, You can have a, a great officer in a department that still has policies that systemically systematically go after and target communities of color. So I want to kind of separate them because uh, I think it's really important. A, a department, we need to reimagine policing. You know, I think that's the conversation we're in right now. Policing um, that is not oriented towards community, that is not looking at de-escalation as the first line of engagement, that is not understanding or coordinated with other violence reduction strategies that do, that use community-driven solutions and and um, and public health approaches um, is 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 not going to provide, I think, the kind of comprehensive support that we really need. We want a comprehensive uh, uh, strategy uh, for the set of challenges we're talking about here. Um, so so you, you need that context. And then we also need, need to make sure that we have a, um, a force that reflects the community, right, that is uh, diverse, that has... Um, a, a real um, understanding of people who are from those neighborhoods, all those things are incredibly important. And I think that the concern your friend has um, about it, you know, policing getting a bad rap has to do with people understand policing through the context of its historical and, and present day um, uh, role in harming people. And I think that, that is not obviously the case that there are many officers who are doing so much work to to really contribute uh, to communities who have these values, but they're single people, right? Um, and I'm not saying it's just one person. I'm saying there are many uh, uh, folks who have this. Um, the I think that the, the the bad rap that policing has will shift when departments actually shift, right? When, you know, like Correct. in the pudding. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I think that when you have comprehensive approaches, when you have all the things I mentioned and policing is doing that consistently, then you will have, I think, people far more interested because they associate officers with people who are these highly trained, you know, like I said, this ninja-like capacity to to. So, to, to address um, uh, issues in communities in a restorative fashion, right? In a restorative fashion. And um, when people have experiences with officers that, that are restorative instead of traumatic and harmful, when they have those experiences, like, wow, that was amazing. I want to do that one day, right? That's, Correct. that's what inspires people, right? Um, we're not quite there yet. And I think conversations um, that start there miss the bigger context. And I think sometimes in the bigger context, you miss the individual officers that are actually doing great work. It's not either or, it's both. There are great officers who are doing incredible work right now that have this analysis, that understand these issues, that do things on their own. I mean, I, I've, I heard stories of officers I mean, there's an officer at one of our trainings who's like, I give out lollipops, you know? And, right. you know, she, she mentioned, you know, she told this really great story of she gave a lollipop to someone, and I hope I'm getting the story right, gave a lollipop to someone, and the woman started yelling at her, right? And, and she just listened. She's like, you know, why is this woman so upset? And the woman said, you know, no one really listens to me. And and because she'd given her the lollipop, she knew she'd listen. So she just kind of aired out all her grievances. And but the but the officer just listened. And then the woman was done. And she, I think she said thank you. You know, it was like one of those situations where it's like, so when when officers have this sort of analysis and they're in communities, healing actually happens. That woman was so grateful to have someone who listened. 
And um, I, I can, I can, I can relate. And I always tie everything back to the students I deal with every day. It's yeah. the same principle. It's the same mm-hmm. concept. It is amazing the results you get when you just listen to somebody. And I, so I don't, I do not doubt that that officer is telling you the truth and not exaggerating. Just the fact that she listened to that constituent did wonders. It's the same thing I say. That's what I do. With, I mean, I have teachers that send students to me. They're looking for punishment. Child comes to my office. I talk with him or her and send him back to class. Oh, Mr. Medley, he don't do nothing. All he do is talk to him. Well, you would be amazed at the listening because the child, they will break down. They, I mean, they're very articulate. They'll tell me exactly what's going on and we'll share and we'll go back and forth. I'll send the child back to class. You didn't suspend them? No, because see, again, they're looking for they're looking for retaliation. They're looking for for me to be punitive. Now, there are times when I have to be punitive, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times, back to what we're talking about, you would be amazed at what just listening will do. That's right. That's right. You know, I've traveled uh, across the country, and I've had... Um, I've had the honor of having conversations with many different uh, police departments about uh, what they're doing, what they're up to. Um, I sat on a panel with um, a a pretty senior, uh, um, uh, you know, like a deputy chief at uh, um, an L.A. uh, LA police department. I've I've gone and observed um, Seattle's police department, Kings County. I've you know, talk to folks in Cleveland. I've, you know, it, it, just across the country, understanding uh, some of the work that's being done. And I've, I've, I've had the honor of, of sitting in on a meeting um, where you had members of the police department, you had social workers and community workers, you even had uh, uh, people who were in uh, law who had more of the legal background people from corrections, and they were actually discussing cases, okay? They looked at people who were maybe at risk or um, uh, of of, of harm of some sort um, uh, and people that folks were aware of and, you know, officers would have like a social interaction. That's what they called it, a social engage, social interaction, meaning they weren't there to arrest the person. They were there to just interact with them and understand how they were doing that day, okay? And they would report back, and, and they as a team would say, you know what, I saw such and such on the corner, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it'll be social workers, officers will, will give these reports uh, and, you know, and they'll, they'll share information. And sometimes the team will say, okay, we should really put them into this program. Sometimes the team will say, you know what, they need to be separated from society for a bit and, and go in, but they're in communication with corrections, so they're in a program, maybe they're in an education program in corrections where they're actually getting rehabilitated. They're actually uh, focused on that person coming. They're, they already have a plan for when they come back out, right? But the, it's, it's in this context of our job is to work as a team to look at the community and understand what interventions would be best for that individual with the goal of rehabilitation, the goal of, of building um, up that person's capacity to be productive citizens and, and, and residents. That idea is, is, is so powerful, um, but it takes a real reimagining. So when people are like, punish, just as you said, right, punitive punishment, what have you, you miss the opportunity of true accountability. You miss the opportunity for people to take responsibility for their actions, do the hard work of actually looking at their lives and thinking about what they can do differently, okay, for children who are so changeable, right? Well, people's brains are changing up until their mid-20s, Okay, like, the, you know, our, our, um, our frontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that makes decisions, doesn't fully develop until we get to our 20s. So young people can change. The behavior you see 
if you can give them new support and resources. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't people who have tremendous amount of trauma in their histories and it's not going to take work. It does take work, but it's possible. We don't want to, we're getting people off the hook by punishing people. You're like, well, we've done our job. When, when, it, when in many ways you've just reinforced uh, a, 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 a level of harm that people will perpetuate over time. Correct. Teaching them new reactions, new, it's a new feedback loop. I do something harmful and I take responsibility for my actions. People listen to the harm that's happened to me. I've heard people, I've sat on panels with people who have done harm to others, violent harm, violent aggression, gone to prison, been in prison, come back out, okay? Never had an opportunity to take responsibility for the harm, even though they went to prison. Correct. Never gotten a chance to take a responsibility for the harm. And when they saw the harm they'd done, or they got present to the harm that was done to them when they were younger that no one paid attention to, when they got present to that, their ability to take responsibility transformed. Their ability to take to take new action in their life transformed. Correct. Actually possible. It's actually possible. And I would much rather have a system that was based on that uh, because it prevents future harm. The recidivism rate in this country is way too high. So we think prison's the solution. It's not the solution. Correct. We can do so much better. And again, we heard this from crime victims, people who have actually experienced the harm at the hands of other people, who've been robbed, who've been violently assaulted, who have had family members die, say to us, we would much rather, there's actually a national survey uh, uh, that was done um, by the Alliance for Safety and Justice that, that, did a, that talked to crime victims said, well, what do you want to see uh, our justice system do? Because you are more than anyone else going to, um, you're, we, need, we want to honor what, what your needs are. The national survey and found that crime victims would far more likely to prefer rehabilitation, do the upfront stuff so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Than, than these downstream things like incarceration, over-policing, because they know the harm it does. See, see survivors are very practical. <laughs> okay? That's right. They're like This is very practical. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. I don't want it to happen to me again. Okay? And if they know that, that, that the system is set up with rehabilitation in mind, then they can be more confident. If we had systems that were expert and how to rehabilitate people, how to really shift. And again, it's embedded within communities. People are more likely to listen to people that they know who are in their neighborhoods, who look like them. Um, using a lens of listening, again, taking responsibility, understanding their own pain, and then holding them accountable. You got to take action. You got to be involved in community service. Um, you have to uh, uh, mentor someone else, right? Like making sure that there are actual uh, uh, actions people can take. Listen, healing is hard work. People don't know this. Right. People associate healing with this kind of like woo-woo thing. Healing takes some serious internal work. And if you are uh, successful, you... You, you transform people's lives. So in our training, in our trauma training, we, we talk about what healing resources are out there. We had a, um, a, a clinician come in and talk about the kinds of cases she sees um, in her work, and it was remarkable. She shared about um, uh, a, a woman who was being trafficked Okay, you know what I mean? Human trafficking, sex trafficking. Yes. Had been, her sex was being sold, okay, by others, by other uh, people. Um, and I, I'm keeping a very general description, uh, uh, general description to um, maintain the confidentiality. But, um, 
and she wanted to get out. This woman was under the age of 18, okay, so in high school, wanted to get out of this situation and, and needed help. And this clinician worked with her, and, and she was able to get out. And, you know, this is, that's, that's, that's not, you know, woo-woo work. That is serious healing to get out of those sorts of situations and shift the trajectory of that young woman's life. Okay, um, that's what's possible. We need to invest in those things more. Um, so, you know, we, as I said, we, we are, EJUSA is really focused on, we're on the case, right? We're really focused on investing in um, a, a, a whole new way we understand justice as true accountability, as something that really heals survivors in the wake of harm, making sure their needs are met, okay, um, and that there are resources available for them to heal, um, and that communities feel safe because they're, they're at the table, right? They, they, they understand what the strategies are to support healing um, and, and to make people safer. And that over-policing isn't the answer to making people safer. It is a reimagined uh, way of doing business that prevents harm for, in the first place. And that, th- that's, that's our analysis. And there's a, real, there's a growing movement in this country to, to focus on uh, those, that level of intervention, that level of reimagining. And we're really excited about it. And we really think that New Jersey... Um, uh, has a real opportunity to to really implement these uh, policies, these systems change, a culture change um, using this lens of trauma. Um, and so we're really excited to be doing this work here. And there are a number of groups uh, that in, in New Jersey, there's a, a New Jersey crime survivors um, group, which is, is focused on um, uh, addressing issues around victim compensation, um, that in the wake of harm, there's actually uh, money available for uh, people, um, and, and money in two different pots, uh, funding for uh, service providers, uh, so like that clinician I mentioned, to do this powerful work with crime victims, right? So change the trajectory of people's lives to prevent future harm. Um, so there's resources for that. Um, there's also resources for individuals to apply. Um, so you think about a family member of a murder victim. They have to do a funeral. Their economic situation might drastically alter because that family member may have been bringing in money to the family. There may be children left behind who don't have a father or um, a, a brother that is supporting, and there's a need for uh, resources. Um, the state of New Jersey has tens of millions of dollars in this for for the, the these um, what I described for service providers like clinicians to do this healing work and for individuals to to get the support in the wake of harm and ha- did not use it. Mark that money and there's a Star Ledger um, article about this. That money. Uh, they had to give it back to the federal government because they couldn't use it. Wow. There's, right? So you talk about the kinds of uh, uh, programming that can happen in schools, the kinds of supports that could really um, uh, really address the core needs. We talk about all those young people who have family members who have died. There's actually resources to support young people. That can actually, I mean, in the state of Massachusetts, they're using their money to actually do a, a fund for for um, schools. Okay, um, that, that there's millions of dollars for this. Okay, that that the state of New Jersey is giving back because they can't use it. Why? Because there, the, there's a lack of vision. Um, there needs to be a rethinking in in state government about how how we can um, make it more accessible, particularly in communities of color where there's far more victimization. So there's real opportunity 
here to shift the way we understand, and there are actual resources to do it. Those resources are used for those hospital-based programs I described. Um, so we, we, there's not a question of, well, where's the money? There's money. There is resources. <laughs> That's okay? right. There is resources. That's right. This is, this is a situation where there is actually money. <laughs> and it just takes, it's, it's about having a vision for how it's used. It's having an understanding of what the issues are. And it's going out there and actually talking to the people who are most impacted by these issues, talking to people who are closest to the problem and are closest to the solution to those problems. Um, and, you know, I think it, I'm quoting Glennie Martin with um, Just Leadership USA, who's done incredible work um, as well. There, there's, there's just this growing number of organizations that are um, doing this work and, we're so proud um, that this movement has this analysis and we really are looking forward to seeing change at a really profound level. Well, I tell you what, with that being said, we have for the most part come down to the end of our interview. There's two people I'm going to, I'm going to offline when I get a chance to talk to you. I want to get, connect you with one of them. You may already know because she is the advocate of advocates in my school. And I'm going to connect you with her as well as that police officer I was talking about, uh, Officer Eason. And because I think there's some synergy there. There's some great things that if the three of you connect can happen in the Patterson area. Um, like I said, the, the person that teaches in my school, you may know her already because she's known throughout the state for her advocacy. And she exactly what you're talking about in terms of the restorative justice. That's her thing. Mm. So, so you may know her whenever I share her name with you. I won't do it on the air, but uh, I'll either email it to you, either we talk offline. The other one is Officer Eason, who I was talking about, who definitely talking, you're talking. She's on the police side. She's community policing. So that you need to talk with her. And the book I'm going to recommend to you, actually, these contributors I've had on the show, we actually did a series on this book over the last couple of months. The book is titled News Chaser, The Rhetoric of Trump in Essays and Commentaries. And the, the editor of that is, matter of fact, he was on the show last week, Daryl Taiwo Harris, Ph.D. Mm. Um, but again, the name of the book is News Chaser, because I think you'll enjoy that. Some of the things that you're talking about is in there, the rhetoric of Trump and essays and commentaries. And I'll put this all in an email to you. I've been I've been corresponding with uh, John. I haven't directly corresponded with you. So I want to thank him. It's John Crane, correct? Yes. John has been the interface between us. I want to thank John for connecting us. Uh, if I can get your email directly, or unless he's copied you on, maybe he's copied you on, but any, in any event, either I'll get it to John to get to you or either you email me directly and I'll get you those two names as well as the name of this book. But for the last couple of minutes of the interview, you have the opportunity to promote where you're going to be, how folks can get in touch with you. You can say anything with the exception of a dollar amount, but how folks can get in touch with you, websites, Great. you know, trainings or anything that you'd like to talk about at this point. Oh, I'll let you do that. So feel free to go ahead and you can promote what you do and who you are. Great. So um, for those of you who just want more information about this analysis, uh, the movement, they want to get involved, please uh, join our mailing list. You can go to ejusa.org. Again, ejusa.org. Sign up for our mailing list. Um, we have one that's focused on uh, what's happening in New Jersey, and then we have a national one. We also... Um, want you to know that the trauma trainings uh, are going on now. And if you're interested in participating, you can actually register online. It's free to attend. Uh, we just ask that you attend all three uh, sessions and you get, you get a certification. Um, so please go to ejusa.org uh, and sign up for uh, registration. It's on our homepage. If you scroll down to the left, uh, there's a link to our fall two, 2017 trauma trainings. Uh, there are ones in the evening, and there are also ones during the day, uh, depending on your schedule. Please feel free to sign up. We still have openings available. Um, I uh, also, you know, want to say that if you, if people have questions, um, you know, I will offer up my email address, and Mark, this is for you as well. Uh, it's my first name, Fatima, F as in Frank, A, T as in Tim, I, M as in Mary, A, H as in Harry, M as Mary, so Fatima M at ejusa.org. That's my email address. Um, 
you know, I my our email addresses are on on the website as well. Um, be in touch. Uh, this is a, a really active conversation. We're organizing uh, meetings to really talk about uh, the kinds of uh, systems change. So we're really looking for advocates who want to get involved and and want to see uh, a New Jersey uh, just kind of rethink how we do things. Um, so we're very excited about it. I know you know we have um, new opportunities with. Um, you know, this upcoming election and gubernatorial race to really have um, new thinking of people who are really motivated uh, to think about new things. So, you know, of course, please vote <laughs> uh, in our in our upcoming election. Um, and we're we're just very excited. So and this is this is not just here. It's, it's national. This is a national movement. Um, and there are a lot of uh, writing uh, about this. And so we we do a digest, actually, of the articles um, that use this analysis because uh, we really deeply care. So there are lots of ways of getting involved, staying apprised of what's happening, getting educated, uh, but also taking action. So please go to our website, ejusa.org. Um, you've got lots of ways of getting involved. Uh, please reach out to me if you have additional questions, want to uh, get involved in, in new ways. We're very excited to to have any participation from, from listeners. So, Mark, thank you so much. I'm really um, re- grateful for that opportunity. Well, thank you for rising early and for joining us and for sharing everything that's going on with Equal Justice USA. And we will definitely be in touch. As I said, I will email the book title as well as the two names like i said one of them i have a feeling you probably already know because i know her and she's involved in all these different things you probably already know her but i'll I'll recommend her name just in the event that you don't because again if she if you link up with her she links up with you it'll she'll do everything her power to push it on our end so all right that's another edition i wish you nothing but the best and i will be in touch all right wonderful thank you so much for having me thank you so much for joining me take care now take care bye-bye all right bye-bye Thank you.